Have you ever wondered uh, if, if Jesus Christ was standing right in front of you in the flesh? You know, have you ever wondered what question you would ask him? You know, I asked this question to some of our staff members and the room went silent. And I wonder how many of us immediately, you know right now, what question you'll ask Jesus? Okay, I have one hand, two hands, three hands, four hands, five hands. Okay, they're, they're, they're going up. Now, the, part of the reason why the room, and I would understand why many of us would struggle to come up with a question to ask Jesus. And it's not because we don't have a question. I actually think the opposite is true. I think we have too many questions to ask that sometimes we don't even know what's the most, if I only have one chance to ask. Like I have Jesus with me here. Like this is the only chance I have. I have to pick the best question. Like I can't waste my opportunity, you know. And so many of us, we have too many questions depending on where you are. Some of us, our, our questions will be based on our pain and our experiences. You know, uh, some of us are just j j life in general. You might have questions that you want to ask uh, Jesus. Uh, um, our youngest son the other day said, you know, the question that he'd ask is that why did Adam and Eve have to eat the apple? Well, not the apple, the fruit rather. And I was like, that's a, that's a great question. You know, I, I think I would ask him. You know, I don't know whether it will help us, but now that we are here anyway, uh, 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 thanks to them. But anyway, I hope that we'll be able to get to heaven uh, 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 by God's grace. And so here's, here's the thing, you know, in our text today that we've just read, we, we find an expert in the law who asks a very important uh, question. You know, an expert in the law was one who had deep knowledge in the religious laws and the, and the traditions, uh, 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 you know, back in the day. You know, the ancient scriptures, they had deep knowledge in all of this. And so he asks this question, and I believe this is one that many of us would want to know the answer uh, to this question. But what the author, who is Luke, of this passage, reveals to us is that there's also a motive. There's something else. Uh, there's something else that is going on inside of him uh, in his heart and in his mind, and we're going to see that in a moment. And so the question that he asks is this, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's, that's a fantastic question, if I may say so myself. This, this man clearly believed in eternal life and recognized that Jesus held the key to him understanding more about that. And I believe this is a question that many of us, whether we realize it or not, we, we, we wrestle uh, every single day. We are trying to figure out, uh, Lord, what must I do to inherit uh, eternal life? Most of us, especially the fact that we are here, uh, it's probably a question. Whether we talk about it or not, deep down we know that there's a longing within us to live a life that leads to eternity. It resonates with something deep within us. So standing before Jesus, in essence, what the expert is saying, so Jesus, tell me the secret. Give me the formula. What is the one thing that I must do to secure my place in eternity? And so Jesus is like, uh, uh, now because you're the expert in the law uh, and, and you've read about it, you tell me what it says. You tell me how have you read it. And this is what it says. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, strength, and mind. And then love your neighbor as you love your... And then Jesus confirms and he says, you've answered correctly. You know, and, 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 and we see that he says, do this and you will leave. That's it. That's, that's all you need to do. Quite simple, right? Huh. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> love God with everything and your neighbor as yourself. So you need to understand that this expert in the law, you know, had deep knowledge of all the 600 plus laws uh, that, you know, the religious leaders of the time, according to them, this is what will guarantee you right living. So for him to hear that this, all those laws have been summarized to just these two, that must have been very hard for him to comprehend. And so Jesus checks into the picture and he affirms and he says, if you get these two right, then you get everything else right. If you get these two commandments right, then everything else is right. It's like you, those of us who are in school. It's like your teacher tells you, out of all the subjects, out of all the programs and activities, if you get these two subjects right, then you'll be successful in school. That's a good deal, right? Like I would want to know. I don't want to waste my time doing things that I should not be doing. You know all those courses that you do, sometimes you're like, why am I doing this course? It will never help me in life. And Jesus comes in like just these two, you know, uh, as the scriptures are saying. Or if someone moves to D.C., I've always wondered, what are the things that you need to do to succeed living in D.C.? Say it again. It's not good. 
What, what do you guys think? If, imagine someone has moved to DC today. Get a what? Get a metro card. I mean, it's rather obvious. Get a metro card. What else for you to succeed in DC? Well, join, join a church. Yes. As a pastor, I should have said, yes, join a church. <clears throat> what else? Say it again. Oh, become friends with a lobbyist. Why? Okay, this is going a different direction. It wasn't supposed to go that way. What if, what if someone is driving in D.C.? What are the two things that you need to tell them that will be successful? Say it again. Okay, one person at a time. Say it again. Don't, don't drive over 10 miles per hour. I mean, you, you have to learn how to parallel park in D.C. If you don't know how to parallel park in D.C., those guys who are clapping, they are, they are angry towards the other people. They know why they are clapping. Because there are people who don't know how to parallel park in D.C. And then the second thing is that you need to know your, your speed limit, right? Otherwise, you, you better create a budget for your speeding ticket uh, in D.C. Or is it that you, you need to know where the cameras are? I didn't... I didn't say that. Don't quote me, please. Johan, please edit that out of, the, out of this. But, but anyway, back, back to the sermon. That is, that is wild. Just thinking about, thinking about the fact that religion has, has... We live in a world where religion has complicated faith too much. It, 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 it's made it so complicated. Uh, Jesus is telling us that these two commandments capture all the others. So, so if we focus on getting these two right, everything else begins to fall into place. And it's not because we're ignoring the other commandments. It is because these two are the foundation of everything else. Are we together? You see, if we focus on loving God, then we don't have to worry about living contrary to His will. Let me explain that. If I focus on loving my wife, I don't have to live worrying about cheating on her or doing things that will create a rift to our, between us in our relationship. All I need to do is just focus on loving my wife. Now, I, I admit the fact that we are human beings and so sometimes we can do things that will make the other person, that we can hurt the other person. But the thing is that when I focus on loving this individual, I gravitate towards loving them and doing the things that will make them feel happy, make them feel cared for, make them feel like, yes, I am concerned about you and not the other things. So if, if out of the abundance and the commitment of my love towards God, then all I do is earn to Him. So I obey what He tells me, not because I am afraid of the consequences, I obey because I love Him. Are we together? And so I'm not living in fear of sin. I am living with in obedience to what God says and what he does. You know, because I want to do the things that he wants me to do. I want to do the things that he would love for me to do. I want to do, do the things that are in his heart. And you know what else is in his heart? Is that I need to love my neighbor as I love myself. That is in God's heart. He wants you and I to love our neighbors. To love my neighbor as I love myself. Because there is... Sorry, can I get this water? There is no way. Thank you, Pastor Aaron. Servant leadership right here. <laughs> there is no way you can separate these two commandments. You cannot say that you love God and you don't love people. Those, those two always go together. There is absolutely no way. You cannot say that you love God without loving your neighbor. In the journey of faith, you will discover that the more you love God, the more you love people. In fact, one of the best ways for you to evaluate whether your love for God is growing is, whether you, is for you to evaluate and see how much you love people. That's one of the best ways. Is your love for people increasing? When you look at yourself from last year to this year, is your love for, for, for people increasing? And remember... What is important for us to, rem to remember is that these commandments are not suggestions. For anyone who has a desire to spend eternity with God, there's an, there's an expectation that Jesus, that these words have created for us here, that we who want to be in eternity with God, this is a commandment to love one another. And so because it's a command, then it means we can do it. 
It means that you and I are capable of doing it. You know why I know that? Because when you read the scriptures, there is no command that God has given that he hasn't given us the ability to fulfill. Every command that God has given, you and I can accomplish that. Because he's the one who gives us the ability to do that. So love God with everything and love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you truly love your neighbor, you wouldn't want to cause any harm to them. In fact, you will love them too much for you to treat them poorly. And you are not just to love them, you love them as yourself. And the loving as yourself here does not mean the self-centeredness, the self-absorption that, we, that is being propagated by the secular world. No, that's not what we're talking about here, where it's all about you. Only care for the people who care about you. You do you, when you want to do you, however you want to do you, with whoever you want to do you with. It's all about you in this life. Life is not just about you. All right? Are we together? Life is not just about you. You know, the, the, what is being propagated is just focus on yourself. The, the secular view of loving yourself is all about you winning regardless of who loses. It, it's all about you prioritizing, you know, your individual's desire with a, in, uh, with a motivation towards personal success regardless of your relationship with God or relationship with others. And, and, and here are some questions that I want to throw at us some, that I've used sporadically in moments of my life where uh, I've, I've used them to evaluate whether I'm making life about me because it's very easy. We are selfish beings. It's very easy. Every one of us is selfish in one way or the other. It's only the degree that varies. And so uh, uh, we need to learn how to ask ourselves some questions where we can go back to how am I living in a way that needs to be selfless as opposed to selfish. Uh, you know, uh, ask yourself, how much time do you spend talking about yourself versus asking about others and, or listening to them? In conversations. It's, it's very easy for you to point out people in your life who do this a lot, right? But I'm asking you to ask yourself. And, and there are times when I've, I've asked myself that question, there are times when I'm like, I catch myself and I'm like, Kevin, you're making, about, uh, 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 you're making this about you. No. Ask yourself, you know, how do you receive feedback? When people give you feedback about your life, do you become defensive? Do you become dismissive? Because if you become those things, it may show that the focus is on preserving your self-image. And, and there's probably a lot more that is deeper there. How often do you show empathy or offer support? How often do you go out of your way to help others or to support others, especially when it does not benefit you? How do you feel when someone else succeeds or is in the spotlight? This is a good one for you to check and find out, you know, am I just making this about myself? Am I just focusing on myself? You see, loving yourself the godly way is about seeing yourself the way God sees you. How God sees me is that he sees me as one that he has created in his own image. He sees me as one that he has loved. He sees me as one that he has forgiven and continues to forgive. He sees me as one that he loved so much that he sent his only son to die on the cross for me because the consequences of my sin deserved death, but he chose his son to come in my place so that he can die for me. He sees me as one that he loves, and in equal measure, I need to see my neighbor the way God sees them. Because then I begin to see them in the same value and identity in Christ. That I see them as one who is loved, as one who's been created in God's image, as one who God sent his only son to die on the cross on their behalf so that they too can encounter eternal life with Christ as they believe in him. That we begin to see one another as God sees us. And you just don't want the best for them. You want God's best for them. How I pray that we can become a community where we get to the place where it's not just about, oh, I just want the best for you. No, I want God's best for you. I want to be able to wrestle with what's God's best for you. I'm not just comfortable with you being comfortable with yourself. Because yourself is not good enough. And we need God's good enough for you. In fact, we need God's enough for you. Let me push it a little bit more. You see, the world will tell me, look at the person in the mirror and do what that person tells you. Focus on you. The, the problem is that most of us, we don't even know what is best for the person in the mirror. And, 
And so, and so this is what happens. Because you're not able to see yourself how God sees you, instead of loving your neighbor as you love yourself, you hurt your neighbor as you hurt yourself. And, and, and so there, there are many of us who you, we are still stuck in unforgiveness. We don't see ourselves. We struggle to see ourselves how God sees us. And, 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 and you struggle to forgive yourself. You're, you're stuck in the pains of the past. You're, 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 you're in this place where you are enraged with the things that have happened in your life. You're still stuck in the bitterness and the anger uh, uh, of, of the past or even your current situation right now. Guess what happens when people come into your life? Guess what happens of, to the people who come alongside you or along your path? You know what happens? You will struggle to see them as God sees them. You will struggle to forgive them. You will, you will struggle uh, uh, to release them when they hurt you because people will make mistakes. You, you will struggle. Uh, you, in fact, you will always be enraged by them. But when you see them as God sees them, you begin to see and experience them through the same lens of God. You recognize that they too are truly and deeply loved by God the same way that He loves you. And so you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with everything that you have and also love your neighbor as you love yourself because God has given you the ability. But you need to start seeing yourself as God sees you so that you can also see the other individual as God sees them. Otherwise, what ends up happening is that there are people who are walking around and what we are doing is that we are hurting one another. There, there are many people who are trying to love you and care for you, but they cannot because you, you don't want, you don't even know how to love yourself. How will you know how to love another or how will you know how you want people to love you? Jesus tells the lawyer and he tells us today, that's it. If you live out these two commandments, you'll have eternal life. Because these two are the core, they are the foundation, they are the bedrock of everything else. Every other command depends on them and cannot exist outside of them. Loving your neighbor is not just a nice suggestion. That's why this series is so crucial. Because it has eternal significance. That's why we are going through this series, because it has an impact, eternal impact, for us to love one another. And then wanting to justify himself. What does the expert in the law say? Who is my neighbor? And now we get to the real issue in this conversation. Do you, have you wondered why, I, I wondered this about myself, you know, how comes he did not ask, how do I love God? Or, or how do I love my neighbor as I love myself? I, I wonder why this, this expert in the law did not ask those questions. I, I, I suggest to you that he, he, he measured himself against these two commandments and he came to the conclusion that the, the first commandment, I probably have done that pretty well because I know all the laws. But then his keeping of the second commandment is predicated upon how one defines neighbor. Are we together? Follow me. I hope I don't lose you. Because this commandment worked up a sense of guilt in the lawyer. Because he, he probably understood the expectation of what it means now to love neighbor as you love yourself. And you and I now understand what it means to love neighbor as you love yourself. And he knew that the bar has been raised and Jesus just confirmed it in this conversation. But now we have a problem. And you know what the problem is? Because there are people that I have a problem loving. The, and, and now you are asking me to love them as I love myself, you know. So, so, so in fact, here's the thing. The, there are people that I even have a problem liking, let alone loving. And, and now, Jesus, you are asking me to love them as I love myself? You need to tell me who those people are. <laughs> you need to tell me. Because now you and I are in the same spot with the lawyer, right? So, so Jesus, tell us. Tell us, who is this neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Who are you commanding for me to love as I love uh, uh, myself? Be, 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 because you better not be talking about those loud ones next door. <laughs> or, or you better not be talking and referring to the neighbor who keeps banging things upstairs. All right? You, you better not be talking about the, 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 you know those ones who are always hosting people and then they have people parking on your spot? 
Those ones, I hope you're not referring to those ones. Because I have a problem loving those guys. Especially the ones who never take out their trash. Uh, um, I, I have no pro- That one, first of all, who is always living there alone and camped. I don't even know about them. Uh, uh, Jesus, you, ne- you better not be talking about the Democrats. <laughs> I-, I sure hope that you're not saying and suggesting that my neighbor is a Republican. I went there. So Jesus, tell us, who's my neighbor? Because what this question reveals, it reveals what's going on over here and here in this individual. But it also reveals a lot of things about us because he's trying to define the boundaries. He's trying to seek and know who, who qualifies as a neighbor. Essentially, who is deserving of my love? Who is deserving of my care? Who is the person that I should love? Because there are neighbors that I just have a problem loving. There are people who are just unlovable. And Jesus, you know that. It's difficult. So I need to know where I need to put up my fence and where I need to put up my wall so that I can determine who is in and who is out so that I can focus on the ones who are in. But Jesus, knowing the deeper issue, he responds to him with a story. He decides to tell a story. You see, some issues can never just be resolved with a simple answer. Some issues need to be resolved with a story. And he shares a story that, it's a popular story that many of us know, and this is the story of the Good Samaritan. And so it's important for us to recognize that this is in response to what's happening right now in the context of this conversation. And, 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 and what Jesus is doing with the story is that he's inviting the lawyer to reflect on this, his question, but also on what Jesus is about to say uh, to him. And so he begins by saying, a man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And this is how it goes. When he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him off his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, He took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Now Jesus asks, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And of course the guy said, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus tells him, go and do, go and do likewise. Jesus flips the script. And instead of answering who is my neighbor, he shows the lawyer what it means to be a neighbor. Because being a neighbor is not about drawing lines around who we should love. It's not about excluding people based on their background, beliefs, or social status. Instead, it's about showing mercy and kindness to anyone who comes along our path who is in need regardless of who they are. I I, want to share this statement and then we're going to unpack it because loving Loving your neighbor. Love isn't about drawing lines. It's about crossing them. Jesus chooses the characters in this story for a reason. The fact that this man was coming from Jerusalem suggests to us that he was a Jew. So the priest, who's a Jew, the Levite, were the most obliged to help the wounded man, the religious leaders. After all, that is what pastors and church leaders should do, right? Isn't that what pastors should do? Help people on the road, right? Are we together? (laughs) But what do we see? That the people expected to be the true neighbors, showing love to their fellow Jew, they passed on the other side and left him for the dead. The Samaritan comes, and it's important for us to remember that the Samaritan was a cancelled individual. They, 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 these guys were, were condemned. You know, uh, Samaritans were bottom of the barrel people. There were sinners and then there were Samaritans. Like these guys were not considered as they were outcasts individual. He comes to the wounded man and so uh, he, he is the last person that a Jew would expect help from. But he came to where the man was and he took pity on him. The priest and the Levite passed on the other side. But we see that the Samaritan walked up to him. He stopped 
And he doesn't hesitate to show compassion. He doesn't hesitate to show generosity and also care. He didn't just leave the wounded man over there with kind words or sympathy. Instead, he went the extra mile. He went above and beyond. He bandaged his wounds. He poured uh, uh, oil on it, uh, uh, put him on his donkey, took him to the inn, and he even paid the innkeeper. He paid for his upkeep, for his, uh, upkeep until full recovery. You see, it's one thing for you to feel sorry for someone or the typical I will pray for you, you know, uh, when someone shares their need, but it's much more powerful when we step in and meet their needs. It's easy for us to express sympathy from a distance. It's very easy for me to tell you, you know what, I'm with you. I'm standing with you. I'm with you in the spirit. Hallelujah. But it takes real love to show up. It takes real love to show up and offer practical help. Because helping people who are hurting, helping people who are dirty, and it's not just physical, helping people who, have, who are messy in their lives, there's just a lot of things that are going on in their lives or in difficult situations, is inconveniencing. It is not always appealing, and at times it's very uncomfortable. In fact, I want to pause and celebrate their two ladies. Last Sunday, you know, they, they, they encountered someone at the, in the metro, and, and they, he, the person wasn't looking okay. And they decided to actually come with the individual to church. They brought the person to church. Uh, later on, we found, that it, found out that it was a case of drug abuse. Uh, but, but the, and they would have come up with so many legitimate reasons as to why they would not have brought this person to church. But, but I want to celebrate their spirit that in spite of the circumstances, they chose to love thy neighbor, that this is an individual who didn't look very well. Our team was able to call the paramedics, and the, the, the paramedics took care of that situation. But I want to celebrate this individual because they did an awesome thing, that they loved on their neighbor regardless of how the person... Now, they would have said, we're going to be late to church, right? Maybe the priest was rushing towards a ministry appointment. We don't know. They would have said, you know what, what if this person turns on us? And, and that's, that's, that's a, a valid concern. But, but they still were moved by the Spirit, and they, they brought this person here. You see, to the priest and the Levite, this wounded man was an inconvenience. Because to a religious leader uh, uh, in that time, uh, especially a Jew, touching someone who was dirty and bloody would have made them unclean. So this was an inconvenience even to their office. Helping him could also disrupt their plans. They were probably tired and looking forward to a break. We don't know. But they saw him as someone to avoid, not someone in need. And guys, many times I have been the priest or the Levite. Many times I have zoomed past my neighbors because I am not in the mood of talking to them. There are many times I've rolled up my window because I don't want to help anyone. There are many times I've been too busy in my schedule. In fact, in a city like DC, we are always moving from one thing to the other. And I wonder, I wonder how many times we have moved quickly past someone who had a need because we were too focused on our schedule or the next thing. And I know I'm guilty of that, and I know there are many in this room who are guilty of that too. Where I, even a friend, I haven't taken time to pause and listen to them. Too often we are driven by our judgment of others and our self-preservation and self-centeredness instead of love. And that causes us to draw lines. It causes us to build these fences and put up these walls. You know, we walk on the other side of the road. You know, uh, we wear our airports. We are burying ourselves in our books, you know, hoping that no one can disturb me. We, we hide behind our closed doors. We hide behind all these boundaries because we don't want to cross this line. But love moves us to cross those lines. You know, it moves us towards those who have need, allowing ourselves to be interrupted and to be inconvenienced. The true measure of being a neighbor is not about deciding who deserves, deserves our love. Because it is e easy for you to judge whether someone is worthy of our help based on their background, based on their situation. But Jesus is calling us here to rise above that mindset. He's calling us to be different. In his story, he redefines what it means to love our neighbor. Because loving our neighbor as yourself means seeing them the way God sees them. Worthy of love, worthy of compassion without condition. And not just meeting their needs where, where, and then we leave them there. But taking care of them and wanting what's God's best for them. Let me, let me push it deeper and then we, we land this plane. 
Jesus is speaking to an expert in the law who is a Jew. And, and, and he tells him to go and do likewise, as the Samaritan did. That, that's the instruction that is given to the, at the end of the message. And, and I want you to consider something else that, that was very powerful and very convicting to me also. And I, I wondered, and I wondered, I'm inviting you to wonder with me. You see, the fact that Jesus did not make the priest and the Levite the hero of the story must have been very puzzling for this expert in the law. Must have been very puzzling for his audience. Because the, the Jew would have identified much easier with the priest and the Levite as the heroes of the story. And, and so for him to hear, first of all, that the Samaritan was the hero of the story must have been very hard for him to comprehend. Because how can one who is beneath me be the one that I emulate? That just doesn't sit well. And that's hard. To take it further, the wounded man was a Jew. What if that wounded man was me? When we desperately need help, we don't get to choose who helps us. When you're in the ditch, you don't get to choose who helps you. You need help. You see, we read this story and we rarely see ourselves as the wounded man. We see ourselves as one of the other three because we like to think we are the ones to help and not the ones to receive help. But when you are half dead and someone offers to help, you don't really have the privilege of judging their accent. You don't have the privilege of judging their skin color, their social status, how they are dressed or who they are voting for. You need help. Perhaps the wounded man saw the priest approaching from afar and thought, oh, the priest is coming. Thank God. God has seen me and he's answered my prayer. Then he passed. He sees another man walking by and he sees, he's like, as he's approaching, he's like, oh, another Jew, a Levite, another religious leader, he will help me. He passes by. And then finally, he sees another man walking up to him. And the closer he gets, he realizes he doesn't look like me. And the more closer he gets, he realizes he's a Samaritan. And he convinces himself there's no way this guy will lift a finger to, do, to help me. Because I am his enemy. I represent the people that we don't, we don't associate with them. In fact, he'll probably be very happy to see me suffer even more. And the Samaritan walks up closely. And I wonder, I wonder whether the, the closer he got, the more afraid the wounded man got because he wondered, will this guy hurt me? Because he represents the enemy side. And the Samaritan walks up to him and he cares for him and he's concerned about him. In asking Jesus, who is my, uh, my neighbor, what this lawyer was doing is trying to establish who is deserving of my love and care so that he can justify who to love and who not to love. And he did not see himself as one who will need that love, one who will need that care, and that he will need it desperately. And in that moment of need, that love would come from the most unlikely candidate you see this is our story this is our story because we don't see ourselves as the wounded people who are half dead in need of Christ's life we don't see ourselves as the wounded individuals and so we are always approaching this conversation from the place of the priest or the Levite or even the Samaritan and we come out of a place like this inspired to go and do likewise. And I want us to go and do likewise. Love our neighbor. But before we walk out, 
there is a greater help that we need. And that is Christ in our lives. There's a greater help that you and I need because we are wounded individuals. He loves you more than you can ever imagine. There's someone in here today and for you, Christ has been a stranger. He represents this community that is different. He, he, he represents something that, is, that, is, that uh, resonates with pain for you. And, and so even when you come into spaces where you really want to connect with others, you find it difficult because you're wondering, will I get hurt? Will I get hurt? And I, and I want to invite you because I want us to pray. You see, many of us, this story of Jesus, it challenges us to redefine our understanding of love. Because the first question that led us into this place is, how can I inherit eternal life? And the lawyer, confident in his religious knowledge, thought that he knew the answer. But Jesus tells a story that flips the script. A a story of a wounded man lying helpless on the road, unable to do anything to save himself. He is completely dependent on someone else to rescue him and not just anyone. A Samaritan, an outcast, he never would have chosen if he thought he could save himself. And this story reveals a powerful truth. We cannot save ourselves. Like the wounded man, we must recognize our desperate need for a savior because religion cannot save us, but Jesus can. There is no amount of religious knowledge or rituals that can secure eternal life. Only Jesus has the power to rescue us from our helpless state. So what will it take for you to realize that you cannot do it on your own? Because eternal life is not earned by what you do, it's received through faith in Jesus. You know, today is Communion Sunday. And before we partake of communion, I wanna make an invitation to someone who needs to say yes to Jesus. That you recognize that you need help. There's a challenge for us to go and love thy neighbor. But it starts with loving God with your heart, with your soul, with your strength, and with your mind. Thank you so much for joining us for District Church Online. Hey, special message, Baptism Sunday is coming up. And if you want to get baptized, we want to especially invite you to our in-person service on September 8th. We will have baptisms after both our 9.30 and 11.30 a.m. service. So to find out more, click the link for baptism in the description and even on the screen. Additionally, one of the ways we really want to get you involved in community life here at the District Church is to have you sign up for our Rooted uh, experience. Rooted is a 10-way experience designed to connect you with God, connect you with community and your purpose uh, here at the district. You can connect to that info using this QR code or click the link for Rooted in the description. It's our joy and privilege to bring you the Word of God each week on YouTube. If this message impacted you, please take a moment and share this message with someone. If you haven't already uh, subscribed, please do that so you can stay up to date with what's going on at the district church. God bless you.